Okay, uh, let me maybe start. Uh, thanks, Gwen. And um, Sarah and me decided that I will be speaking first. So, <laughs> um, hello, everyone. My name is Alexander Berescu. Hope you hear me well. Uh, Gwen, could you please tell me that if, if you can hear me uh, good? Yeah, you're moment. just fine. You're, Perfect. You're very thanks. Yeah. thanks a lot. Um, my name is Alexander Berescu, and I am associated professor in uh, at Liverpool Technical National University, Ukraine, and also I'm a general board member of, at Eurodoc, as well as I am uh, now coordinator of Eurodoc Open Science Ambassadors cohort. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, hope you can see it. Yeah, and uh, today we will be talking about how early career researchers can boost open science on the example of Eurodoc. Yeah? Eurodoc is uh, the European Council of Doctoral Candidates and Junior Researchers, and it's an international federation of 28 national organizations all over Europe from 26 countries. So it's a big organization with um, big representation from many European researchers, communities, and communities of early career researchers. Yeah? Um, so as um, today we are in the middle of Open Access Week 2020, uh, and the topic of this year's Open Access Week is open with purpose, taking action to build structural equity and inclusion. So uh, let us um, discuss how open science can advance equity and how we can all contribute to it. So uh, open science um, has been uh, recognized as one of uh, the main parts of European vision for quite a long time. And um, now Europe uh, aims at open science, aims at openness and uh, takes many efforts to get there. So um, what does it mean? Um, Foster project, which is one of the educational projects on open science defines uh, open science as the practice uh, of science in such a way that others can collaborate and contribute. So um, open science is not a new science. It's uh, just more open and transparent way to practice science, actually, yes. And um, open science supports validation and the reproducibility of research, uh, reduces um, academic cases of academic misconduct and promotes academic integrity and helps to maximize the impact of research by involving many stakeholders, yes? So uh, if you look at uh, the open science roadmap, it's everything but tiny, it's really huge. And if you uh, look at this, you can see that there are different branches. So open science is an umbrella term uh, which contains many different um, subsections, yeah, like open access, open data, open and fair data, open reproducible research, open science evaluation, including open peer review, which is very important, uh, open science policies and open science tools. Uh, there are four main pillars of open science, open data, open code, you mean, I mean programming code, yes, yeah, source code, open papers, which is open access and open peer reviews. Um, it's important that researchers practice open science on all stages of research workflow from the very beginning till, early, uh, till the final stages. So um, <clears throat> from the conceptualization to publishing, yes. And if we examine it a little uh, more, so um, for instance, during the planning stage, um, it's a good practice to share your ideas on social media to get early feedback and uh, involve as much stakeholders as possible, like non-academic partners, industrial partners, 
uh, what is also important, uh, it's important to check if there are any existing data sets which can be reused <clears throat> because uh, no one wants to reinvent the wheel, of course, yes, and uh, building upon others' work is very important. Uh, many people are afraid of sharing ideas early because they are afraid of being scooped. Yeah, and uh, the very good remedy to this is the pre-registration of your research. So before you even start uh, doing some experiments, doing some uh, serious work, you can pre-register your, re your research, and uh, so everyone knows what you are doing. Okay, uh, during the active stage, actually the, the research, it's good to uh, share uh, your uh, methodology and area findings via preprints. Preprints are non uh, unpeer reviewed papers, which have some restrictions, of course, but what um, they are good at, they are good at sharing your ideas and results very quickly. I will get back to this later on. Okay, also pre-registering your results. And also, which is very important, uh, many researchers find it very useful to uh, involve citizen science into their projects. There are several websites like Zooniverse, where you can involve uh, general public, even non-professionals and people from other fields to help you with your research. And of course, uh, final stage, which is maybe a crucial one yeah, for open access. Of course, it's important to publish your research in open access and sending your data to uh, open repositories. And uh, it's also important to um, add special metadata to your work and link it to your profile with uh, or seed and use DOIs for identification. Uh, one small thing which can be very useful for you is using uh, so-called lay summary. So summary of your research for non-experts. This can be journalists, then media people, this can be researchers from other fields. And uh, sometimes it's very helpful because journalists can uh, find your research and you can be a superstar in the next morning, you know? <laughs> okay. Um, so it all sounds like extra work, right? But now we are uh, approaching the good effects of open science, which are worth fighting for. Yeah? So uh, open science and open access uh, allow us, uh, they give us many important advantages. Let's start from the very egoistic, yeah, personal level. So people who publish in open access, who practice open science are much more visible. So your chances to get noticed, to get cited increase dramatically, yes? Uh, also other people can uh, use your data if you share it and build upon your work and your data can also be cited. Yeah? Your data, your source code. Uh, you, your research can, as I already said, uh, media can take it and you can become an influencer. So your uh, vision and your um, personality will be more recognizable and you will have much influence on society in general. <clears throat> Uh, what is also important, and now we are uh, uh, slowly um, getting to the equity thing, uh, researchers from uh, poor countries, from developing countries can uh, view your work. Uh, I am from Ukraine and I remember times when uh, open access was one of the few options to get the papers from your field, if you are working in a specific field especially. So it's, it's really very good uh, for science in general in the world. Yeah? And uh, of course, uh, nowadays Europe boosts open science on all levels. And if you want to be successful, if you want your research ideas to uh, be found, found, funded, if you want to get money for your research, very simple. <laughs> you need to be, you need to know how to work in open um, style, let's say. Yeah? So um, many important uh, international organizations recognize open science as a crucial thing nowadays. And for instance, UNESCO um, 
states it's a quotation that um, open science can be a true game changer in interconnecting science, technology, innovation, and society. And um, for this, equal opportunities for all scientists, policymakers, and citizens have to be promoted. Uh, if we go uh, to UNESCO's, again, principles of uh, open science, which they published not long ago, three important um, priorities are equity and fairness, diversity and inclusiveness. Um, they are promoting equity among researchers from developed and developing countries, equal access to scientific knowledge. Uh, they are embracing a diversity of practices, workflows, languages, which is important, yes. And uh, engaging scientific community as a whole, as well as wider public and other stakeholders. Um, in short, for me, open science uh, almost equals uh, equality because if something is open, you don't have paywalls, you don't have restrictions. And in this case, you can involve many people and everyone is invited. Um, important thing to mention, we are now living in very strange times and uh, pandemic has changed many things, but open science is, uh, many people think that open science is critical to combating COVID-19 and um, real-time sharing, open sharing of research publications, research data, is very important to um, boost academic collaboration in order to focus on this fight, global fight against the corona. Um, so every crisis, uh, it's, it, it might be a bad thing, but it's also an opportunity and uh, nature recognizes the COVID-19 crisis as it underlines that uh, how fast and open science can be when um, scholars are using torrent servers to share preprints on COVID on many important um, public servers, the rate of collaboration increases dramatically. So um, COVID just showed us how how collaborative and open uh, this process of scientific publication and evaluation can be. Yeah? But uh, what is important to mention that is that we still have to learn how to deal with unpeer-reviewed knowledge because it's very imp important that we can only uh, rely on peer-reviewed knowledge and peer-reviewed papers. So uh, we still have to understand that preprints are an, they are an amazing thing, but we still have to um, recognize and understand the differences. There is a very good uh, preprint again uh, called Open Science Saves Lives, Lessons from the COVID-19 Pandemic, which I uh, recommend because uh, in this preprint there are, the research workflow is analyzed and um, the most um, important threats to it are um, discussed. Okay, so now we are finally getting to the main question of my presentation. How can early career researchers boost open science? And uh, Eurodoc has an answer to this question. Uh, and this answer is called Eurodoc Open Science Ambassadors. Okay, uh, you know, I, I really like this picture. It's uh, from 16th century by Hans Holbein the Younger. Is it's called ambassadors. So this is very important people who have some um, rich luxury outfits of the time, yeah? Um, so what is an ambassador? An ambassador is a person uh, who, is promo uh, who is promoting some idea or organization, yeah? And in Eurodoc, we have a group of people who promote open science. Um, it's not something completely new. Uh, very uh, similar things already exist. For instance, Center of Open Science, it's in the United States. They have their own open science ambassadors worldwide. PhDNet, Max Planck, they have open access ambassadors. Plan S, which you probably know, 
we heard about um, have their own ambassadors and uh, Garrett O'Neill, which is the previous uh, president of Eurodoc is one of the ambassadors. But do we need another cohort? Yes, I think we do. Uh, there is an important uh, popular uh, chart called uh, Diffusion of Innovations um, Curve, according to Everett Rogers, and there is a so-called chasm, you know? So if uh, some new thing, which is important, has to uh, jump over this chasm yeah, uh, to become really popular. Uh, and in my opinion, uh, we really need to uh, take effort to help open science jump over this chasm and we need to promote it whenever possible and open science ambassador is a good instrument for this yeah okay so uh, what is open science ambassador actually it's an training course created by Garrett O'Neill and Ivo Gregorov to train researchers in key practices of open science so in order to become an ambassador you have to pass this uh, course and also you have to pass the course at Foster project and after that when you if <laughs> you pass the exam, uh, you are one of the Eurodoc Open Science Ambassadors. And okay, let me show you the map of Eurodoc once again. And after that, I will show you the map of uh, current ambassadors distribution. So we have, at the moment, we have 24 uh, ambassadors in 18 European countries, which is a distributed network of action from Ireland to Azerbaijan. <laughs> It's really very distributed. And um, my vision of our network is a network of action. So we have to do things together and also locally in our, together internationally and locally on local, national, uh, national, local and institutional levels. Yeah? So what Open Science Ambassadors actually do? Uh, random three uh, tweets from our community one uh, blog post from Anna Slavitz, me presenting something uh, at the Ukrainian University and another tweet, analytical tweet from our um, ambassador, Eva Knatkova. So let me start from international level first. And let me just um, highlight three uh, important results of previous year of our activity. So first important result is, um, Eurodoc survey on publishing in open science, uh, which was, it was all uh, European level survey, which we created uh, for the general European researchers community, but uh, it was tailored specifically for Open Research Europe project. The Open Research Europe is open access publishing platform European wide, which was commissioned by um, European Commission and it will be launched early in 2021. And Eurodoc is an expert partner, is this huge, important European project. And uh, Eurodoc ambassadors were in the core of all these actions. Yeah. You can uh, learn more about uh, the project following the QR code. Second important thing is uh, Eurodoc collaboration with open uh, clouds. For instance, uh, one of the ambassadors is uh, collaborating with CERN Open Lab, and uh, we Eurodoc is distributing vouchers from um, free cloud services to researchers. And um, so far, I guess that uh, 24 um, early career researchers who are working on COVID-19 topics uh, have been awarded uh, certain vouchers for free usage of uh, open research clouds infrastructures. And uh, third important result is Erasmus Plus project, which was awarded to a nice consortium and uh, which was shaped with the help of open science ambassadors and uh, our friends from uh, France, Belgium, and Ukraine now are uh, working on this big project, which will start on 15th of January, 2021. And there is a huge opportunity to increase level of uh, open science and promote awareness in Ukraine. So uh, these are results of international level. And uh, to be honest, there are uh, many, many results on local and institutional levels. I just 
suggest that you um, visit your doc website and see our yesterday's short interview with Anna Slavitz, who is your doc open science ambassador for Slovenia. <clears throat> and uh, this interview will be followed by other similar interviews from other ambassadors and you will quickly understand what we do and what uh, and how we are preaching yeah <laughs> so um speaking at events online events at the moment but still um applying for grants together advocating for open science at national level uh, for instance for instance um ukraine ukraine has a member of Eurodoc in Ukraine, it's National Association, it's Young Scientist Council at the Ministry of Science and Education, and they are advocating for open science on the national level, and the situation is similar in many other countries. Uh, please follow the QR code to learn more about uh, actions in Slovenia. So uh, if you are interested, please visit our um, website you can follow this link or use this QR code and you can learn more about the course and learn more about the current cohort and uh, maybe you are also interested in joining us uh, what is important you don't have to be a member of Eurodoc administration to become Eurodoc ambassador you just want uh, you just uh, need to pass the course so we are sure that you know what you are talking about yeah and also uh, you uh, you uh, need to have uh, passion for this and uh, ability and um, will to change something on your local level at least so Again, if you are interested, uh, please follow this link and fill in the Google form, uh, and I will uh, get back to you shortly. Um, the current cohort of ambassadors uh, will end its action soon, and we will uh, soon be recruiting the new cohort. We plan to uh, release the information on the last day of uh, this open access week so maybe sunday monday you can check our website and if you are interested again join us so uh, thanks a lot for listening i hope uh, you will have some questions for me and uh, if you have some questions uh, after the presentation please drop me a line uh, on email or Let's communicate on other uh, messengers. Let me maybe check if there are any questions. Okay. I don't see uh, many questions at the moment. I don't see any questions at the moment, to be honest. Uh, but uh, maybe you will have some after our presentation, yes? Okay, just a practical question. Where can I find the link for the form? Uh, one moment. Here you are. Let me just... Yeah, here it is. So uh, as far as I understand, our organizers of the webinar will share uh, my presentation after uh, the webinar, but you can do it now. You can follow uh, this link or just scan the code Maybe. and fill Maybe in. You can copy paste it in the oh. chat as well. That's a good, uh, that's uh, okay. So people can follow it directly. Uh, okay, I will try to. Um, 
it's Q and A, right? Or it's another. Uh, you can just put it in the chat box. That's a, okay. It's just for the people here, and then they can directly follow. The okay. Link. Yeah. Yes. Done. Mm -hmm. I will uh, write everyone, so don't be shy. Don't lose this opportunity to take action. Okay, uh, any other questions, please? Um, then thanks again, and maybe uh, I can invite our second speaker, Sarah Pile. Yeah, thank you, Alec. I would like you. I would ask you to um, share my presentation. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Uh, please tell me when I have control. Okay. So, uh, hello, everybody. I'm really happy to uh, be able to talk with you today about equity and inclusion, especially uh, since I am a PhD candidate candidate in history of contemporary China, uh, but I'm also uh, the co-coordinator of Eurodoc Equality uh, Working Group. And uh, I'm not sure that I can control. Uh, sorry. Uh, Is it working, sir? Uh, it's not working, I think. Do you have the... Uh, yeah, yeah I got it. I got okay, it. Okay. Yeah. Just a bit. I'm really sorry, but I have a slow <laughs> computer. So um, what is the Equality Working Group? Um, Oleg already um, explained to you what Aerodoc is. And uh, within uh, our association, uh, we have uh, a working group that was built to support uh, early career researchers that for, uh, deal with difficulties um, related to diversity and uh, exclusion. And uh, last term, uh, I coordinated, um, I started coordinating this working group and we focused on uh, especially gender, um, sexual orientation and disabilities as uh, sources of discrimination, uh, especially because in our working group we uh, just engage people from uh, disadvantaged categories and so uh, we try to speak up uh, these in particular situations, but then we just uh, widen our uh, scope farther, especially after the uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, broke out, uh, since we got a lot of uh, new issues about uh, equity and uh, inclusion. So uh, our strategy is built on these four keywords. So uh, the first aim is to raise awareness on the equity and inclusion uh, issue, uh, because it's very important to see the problem to solve it, let's say. And uh, to do this, we try to engage uh, uh, as much early career researchers as, as we can, especially because each situation is different. It is important to have uh, self-representation for uh, speaking out real problems and proposing um, concrete solutions. Uh, so the main objective, of course, is to advocate for concrete changes that can uh, help pe people to feel included in a scientific uh, community and uh, in, to boost their possibilities to have a, a good career development. And to do this, we cooperate uh, with uh, stake stakeholders, partners, and other associations that have similar uh, aims. And this is extremely important in this topic because equity and inclusion is not something that we can uh, tackle uh, alone, but we must do it uh, together. So um, I, I will try to explain a bit why we build on this strategy and to share some experience. So um, the first thing we need to uh, remember is that inequality and exclusion are the results of the interaction of more than one factor and the social environment. So it's not something that it's given, but it's something that we as member of the social environment we live in uh, can change actively in our everyday uh, life. So I'm, I'm very proud of this picture because uh, if you're not mm, understanding how this uh, factors are linked, uh, I was able to um, represent the problem. So the point is that even if some of these factors of uh, sources of inequality are uh, more likely to occur together, it's not really easy to understand how each people is affected by uh, gender, ethnicity or disability, 
and I, I would like to say that some disabilities are invisible. So uh, don't take anything for granted in this uh, domain. So it is extremely important to um, design solutions that are able to tackle with more uh, factor at a time. And this is what we call an intersectional uh, approach to discrimination. Uh, another important thing uh, is that inequality is embedded in organizations. So there is not one community in the world where, where uh, inequality uh, doesn't exist. It's, every, it's everywhere. <laughs> and uh, now I'm going to build uh, this part of the presentation on uh, John's, uh, John Acker's uh, article on gender and organizations that was focused on uh, gender inequality. But uh, I think actually that this paper is very useful for understanding also other types of uh, discrimination in organizations. So Ake point out, points out that um, each organization um, has its particular culture and this culture uh, influences the organizational arrangements uh, each community use for everyday work and that are able to reproduce inequalities uh, in the end. So, uh, if we think about research community, we have uh, an ideal member, let's say that usually is male, white, an English speaker, middle-aged, devoted exclusively to his research mission, and overall a genius. And you can already see that it's quite excluding for some other kind of people like women or not white people or people that don't speak, not, don't speak very good English, for example, and young researchers. <laughs> So uh, we have also um, an idea of roles, which we can um, impersonate, let's say. So we have one boss and many assistants. So that uh, this um, way of uh, imagining a relationship um, suggests also the idea of power and balance, which is one key sort of source of uh, discrimination, and uh, also competition, both horizontally among uh, the assistants, let's say, and also uh, vertically uh, from uh, top down and uh, down to top. And of course, given this kind of, uh, let's say, ideal community, uh, we also use specific team building strategies. So uh, conferences are one uh, nice example because I've read lots of uh, papers and stories complaining about uh, coffee networking doing, uh, done during, uh, during the coffee breaks um, that it's usually done um, standing. That is <laughs> makes uh, for, uh, for people on wheelchair, for example, very difficult to be physically at the same level of other uh, researchers. And this suggests, again, a difference of uh, level as people and uh, ability of networking. Of course, we do uh, jokes on other groups and other researchers, maybe uh, highlighting something that is wrong with them. So we are excluding them for our community in uh, also just, I mean, psychological uh, level, but we do. And then we have uh, sexist, or racist jokes that uh, are very helpful uh, for uh, team build uh, in male dominated environments. And I left this in italics because uh, this is something that is more and more censored as a behavior and it's already changing. So this is a good example uh, about things that we can change if we just focus on how exclusive uh, against other people can be. Okay, so given this uh, underlying culture, it's no wonder that uh, uh, the team structure that we see today in the research community is a, a competitive system uh, with uh, many people, I mean, just individuals, but also research groups and also uh, universities that are competing to be the top uh, ranking uh, world university. So <laughs> this is something that uh, pushed towards um, very uh, heavy working uh, patterns. So work as much as you can, uh, every time you can. <laughs> and this is uh, confirming already the idea of being devoted solely to the uh, research mission and nothing else. And this is, of course, it's something that uh, recreates and recreates their publish or perish uh, system. That is something that in the end reproduces 
the image of the ideal member I said at the beginning, because uh, if you have family to care uh, after, if you uh, spend your time on, let's say, voluntary activities, maybe you publish one article less. And uh, so only those that are completely devoted uh, to research and uh, don't, need for, don't need, for example, to do other works to, uh, let's say, pay for the unpaid and uh, short-term precarious contract, um, so all these people are excluded. So this is something that reproduces the inequality uh, we started with. So uh, this is the theoretical level, but uh, if we want to change, wh where to start? Uh, sadly to say, but we need to do uh, both levels at the same time. So we need to change both the culture and the um, arrangements. Uh, so we need to raise awareness to make people see the problem and uh, invite them to change their beliefs. Uh, but at the same time, we also need to uh, allow people that are not the ideal member to show that given the proper environment, they can be as excellent as the ideal member. If we don't give the people uh, the chance to prove they are good researchers, uh, they will never become researchers. So. Uh, we, again, we reproduce the inequality uh, again. Uh, a good, wait, I lost my, again, <laughs> the control of the uh, presentation. I don't know what's happening, but any case, uh, this is something, I mean, uh, for example, open uh, science is already doing, so changing uh, some arrangements about, for example, where to publish, how to publish, and it's something very important uh, for um, giving proper space to people that uh, are usually excluded, but also contents that, I, uh, that are usually uh, excluded from uh, closed journals, uh, let's say, but we of course need to change both things uh, at the time. So we need to push push further on uh, the culture beneath uh, open science. Oleg, do you need do uh, can you um, try to move? Okay, okay, great. I made it. Sorry, <laughs> it's very difficult. So uh, this is for explaining that I'm going around for webinars with this very cheap computer that I paid myself because my university doesn't uh, supply computers. But uh, so I'm just <laughs> this is a part of the problem about inequalities uh, maybe <laughs> among uh, people that uh, are equipped differently. So uh, what is important here about um, this, okay, uh, I was saying changing uh, arrangement and culture at the same time. So the COVID-19 crisis um, imposed some uh, big organizational, um, new organizational arrangements. So like the lockdowns um, had many people working uh, from home. And uh, uh, so many contracts were suspended. So we have many, um, changes that at the first uh, in the first moment heavy impact um, on disadvantaged groups so we have read a lot of articles about women being um, left behind in the publication rate so yeah it's good to publish uh, open if you have the time to write something <laughs> and not uh, i mean so this to say that um, being able to publish somewhere does not does not mean that you are able to publish on time i mean because you are caring about other uh, other things so these um, problems um, show that we really need to be more inclusive if we want to keep up um, our scientific contribution to society and so this gives us the chance to push further to change the culture and um, I had this surprise recently because uh, less than one year ago, uh, during a um, course on gender equality in higher education, the trainer asked us to look for researchers on uh, Google image. And what we, uh, the results, I mean, um, gave us the image of the ideal member I thought, talked about uh, before. I did the same thing a few days ago for this presentation and this is what I got that left me really uh, surprised. So I tried to do the same research with other computers logging from different uh, accounts to say, and maybe it was not, uh, it was um, something that Google just chose for me <laughs> because I'm so uh, 
focused on equality. But uh, yeah, this is, I mean, try you, and I invite you to try uh, it at home because uh, really I was uh, amazed about this uh, change that uh, I think is the result of uh, how much we talked in the last month about uh, the dropping uh, of uh, female researchers' papers and also about, uh, uh, I mean, the uh, Black Lives Matter that was um, an important moment where a lot of people uh, were discussing on uh, how, uh, I mean, there, there are so many black scientists that are working, but not so many that are publishing. So uh, this is something that uh, raised a lot of awareness about uh, ex exclusion in our uh, community. So uh, yes, everything is very nice, but in the end, uh, we should change the way we mm, way we evaluate uh, the research. I mean, uh, so we can publish, but then of course we need to be uh, hired to be. We need to be promoted to advance our careers, and if we keep evaluating only the papers. Uh, we are going to lose the different challenges, the different behaviors, uh, the different um, struggles that are uh, behind this pile of these piles of uh, book. I mean, just uh, evaluating if one writes a lot or not so much doesn't uh, don't tell us if uh, how these people are coping with their uh, struggles. And um, what I really care most <laughs> is that um, science is a community. Research is possible only within a community. And uh, um, so we really need to promote scientists that are able to write good things, but at the same time are able to make their working environment a place where also other can write good, good things. If we build our careers destroying other careers, we are not advancing science. We are just advancing our uh, personal uh, objectives. So what can we actually do for <laughs> changing things? Uh, I mean, evaluation is not something that uh, we, we can change as early career researchers. I mean, we, we are trying to do that. We are <laughs> advocating a lot also on, uh, on this. But what every one of us can do every day in our uh, life is, first of all, question our assumptions. So don't take for granted anything. If your colleague is not answering your emails or um, it's always behind with deadlines, uh, maybe you can pick up the phone and ask what's going on. Because maybe this person is struggling with something, both on professional or personal level. And talking with this person as a person, not as a worker or a producer, uh, you can uh, understand how you can change the environment for making it more inclusive for this person. And sometimes it's really uh, just talking and be, feeling supported is already really helpful. So uh, asking others, what can we do to feel, to help them feel at their ease is the root of finding concrete solution for change. Of course, when we, you have an idea of good solution, you should advocate for this change to be, in, to be implemented within uh, the organization that is your department or uh, the wider community uh, international, <laughs> international level. And what again, again and again, strive towards a cooperative working environment. And this is extremely important because if we work in a competitive environment, we cannot profit for supporting those that are disadvantaged because all the time I spend uh, trying to help a colleague that having that is having difficulties in finding uh, something to uh, improve their research, I'm losing time that I can use for publishing more than him and uh, getting a promotion instead of him. In a cooperative environment, each of us profits from the other's well-being and from different perspectives. So it's something, this is something that makes science uh, strive towards uh, more integrity, higher quality, and uh, in the end, uh, more efficacy in, in the world. 
So to sum up, sorry if I got emotional, <laughs> but I really care about uh, this point because it's something that makes a difference really, I think. So each solution uh, we implement needs to be carefully tailored, both empowering and engaging our members. So asking people, each person, what they need <laughs> for uh, do their work in the best way. And uh, um, we also need to make to sit at the same table to address issues in the efficacious and respectful manner. Since we are all different, uh, for sure, one solution is going to benefit someone more than others. But if we sit together and we try to cooperate toward the best solution, we can find a way to uh, work together in an efficacious um, way. And uh, uh, I would also say that this, this is the, um, I mean, uh, the key behavior behind democracy. So this is what makes our science more democratic. This is what makes also our society, I mean, in the wider sense, more democratic. Uh, if we think that science is something that should help society to uh, walk toward a better future, we also need to protect this way of uh, dealing with problems altogether. So uh, these are some references. I mean, if you want to read something that uh, we wrote in this uh, last month, and uh, this is my contact and uh, the Eurodoc Quality Working Group uh, email. So if you want to be uh, involved in our work or you want to share some uh, experience or um, you have some questions after uh, this presentation, please feel free to to write, and I will answer as soon as I can. So thanks a lot. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah and Alexander. This was very interesting. Um, there are not really that much questions, so <laughs> that either means I think that means you're very uh, uh, the presentation was very interesting and very clear. Um, do you have anything that you want to start a discussion about? With the audience, uh, remember uh, I can, if you want to, for the participants, I, if you raise your hands, I can allow you to talk. Yeah, I'm seeing from the chat that you got similar results, so it means that uh, <laughs> things are already changing <laughs> in some way. It's a nice surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, from um, photo business perspective i'm an amateur photographer so i know that uh, um, in recent years the demand for uh, displaying inclusivity in uh, images is very high so yeah it's completely understandable it's a good uh, move uh, movement forward in this regard but actually um, maybe you notice that um, my presentations was more about like really open science and Sarah's were more about um, yeah. inclusivity and um, equity. But um, I think that for us, uh, openness, I mean, openness in access to research data and publications to uh, different scientific um, features is the same thing that equality, because uh, when something is open, when there is a box of apples, everyone can take one. So it's very simple. And if we have paywalls, if we have um, some restrictions, then uh, community becomes uh, exclusive. And you have to decide uh, who you who you uh, invite, who, who is invited and who is not. So that, that's how it works. Uh, that's how we connect these two topics and um, moving forward one of them moves another yeah uh, okay uh, maybe someone still wants to contribute maybe some questions uh, i know that our presentations are on, on the general level of course because we don't have uh, much time but um, as, as I said, we have we invite all of you because uh, I think that most of the participants of this webinar are early career researchers. So you can join your doc through uh, your national association and uh, your doc open gr working groups as a quality working group or open science working group are open uh, to many people. 
they are uh, exclusive. Uh, sorry, inclusive, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. And our ambassadors, Open Science Ambassadors program is also an inclusive community with people from uh, different uh, countries, different backgrounds. Um, and we try to make it uh, gender equal, but at the moment there are much more uh, women than men. So <laughs> we are on the right path for sure. Okay, uh, maybe uh, there are some comments. Okay, are you polls? That's a poll from. Uh, uh -huh. Okay, but I, I think that we can't vote. We can't vote, yeah. Ho hosts and panelists can, cannot vote. Okay. So I can say that I was really interested about, uh, you know, the description you made about, because uh, as you can understand, we work in Eurodoc in uh, different working groups. And then we, of course, we strive all together from different perspectives to the same results. So making science more uh, open, accessible, and uh, uh, find so concrete solution to be all the part of all a part of this uh, big community so i was really interested and i think uh, i make an announcement that i'll take the ambassador training because you really uh, got me in <laughs> <laughs> perfect yeah yeah uh, so let me just give, give one comment so uh, sarah has a very interesting research focus maybe sarah you can announce it uh, it's, it's, it's really very very interesting and uh, i think that um, her, her research focus will uh, give another level of diversity to our uh, diverse group. Sarah, could you please tell us? Yeah, yeah. About I that? work on uh, history of contemporary China, so I'm a sinologist. And this is very, uh, I can tell a very interesting story about uh, science being English speaker, <laughs> uh, because I met lots of people saying, oh, Chinese speak very bad English. <laughs> and uh, But then when I ask how good is uh, their Chinese, uh, people usually say, I don't speak Chinese. <laughs> so, I mean, this is something important. So we have 50. Mm -hmm. 3% of uh, early career researchers, but also 36%. Uh, so the, the majority of uh, participants is uh, early career researchers. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. That's very good. So it's really nice to see how things can change. I mean, uh, so it's, uh, it's important to, uh, yeah, add diversity of our groups. So if you are, if you feel that you can contribute uh, uh, with your experience, uh, I mean, it's, we are always very open to new uh, people really to join. Uh, what is important is that uh, the concept of early career researcher uh, differs much from from sorry from young researcher. Yeah. So you don't have to be young uh, to be early career researcher. It's just uh, you know um, it's completely different concepts and um, people who it's 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 more about career not not age, and uh, we uh, in the questionnaire in the survey I mentioned, there was a question. Uh, we asked people if they consider themselves early career researchers. So if you consider yourself an early career researcher, please consider also being an open science ambassador of your So, uh, I mean, I'm wondering if uh, we were so engaging and clear in our presentations that nobody was going to ask questions or that, uh, I don't know. But in any case, really, if you, uh, I mean, need time to reflect on what we said today and uh, you want to uh, ask some questions in the next days, uh, please feel free to do so. Yeah, and I also want to add that <clears throat> your book in general uh, stands for nice things. And uh, we always need uh, extra volunteers. There's uh, huge amounts of work and uh, very nice and interesting work on international level. <clears throat> and uh, helping hands are always needed. Uh, you can uh, look at our structure on the website. <clears throat> there are many working groups from um, equality to open science and from, uh, I guess- um, Doctorate training. Exactly. Yeah, career yeah. development. Yes, everything, <laughs> every, everything. So yeah, uh, if you want to join, please do. And if you have some questions, you have our contacts and you're more than welcome to ask. <laughs> Gwen, maybe um, you have some final comments. And... No, I, I, I would ju just like to thank you very much for this very interesting webinar. Uh, it's very nice. 
to see uh, all of you also quite a lot of new faces and uh, participants. So that's what I, uh, that's really always very interesting. Um, I will share the presentations um, and the recordings, and maybe I can also add your contact details to that, to that, so that people, the people here can actually uh, see, uh, you know, get in touch with you directly if they want to join. So sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so um, that leaves me nothing but to close this and to. Uh, invite you all for uh, the final webinar of this uh, of this week uh, tomorrow at uh, noon exactly let me just share let me just share the, the announcement if you didn't register yet uh, so this is uh, the final one it's in collaboration with core it's about open science policy so it might also be it it might be seem a little bit maybe too too highbrow for uh, for early career researchers, but on the other hand, the sooner you, you you know like you get involved with this, or you like let you hear your hear your voice, uh, more interesting it will be for you, and the more like weight you can <laughs> you can throw in. So I would uh, invite all of you uh, cordially to join us tomorrow. You can uh, register via the Open Access Week uh, website. Uh, and in that case, uh, nothing left for me but to thank you both and uh, see you in. Uh, yeah, see you later. <laughs> Thanks, Gwen. Have a, have a nice evening to all of you. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.